So last week when we were talking about kind of the move from classical theism and away from classical theism, we, we talked a little bit about from above and from below theology. Theology from above is kind of the classical way of doing things where the philosophers say, hey, God has to be like this because this is what perfection is. And that's how we kind of figure out what God is like. Um, and, and there's value in that. There's certainly a lot of value in trying to imagine or trying to think through um, what perfection is, what goodness is. And so I, I you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to denigrate classical theology because I think it's really, really helpful. But it does have um, some major drawbacks, and we started looking at a few of those. And so last week we talked about, you know, the, the issue of immutability, right? God not being able to change. Because change implies imperfection, right? Well, that's a really cool philosophical, you know, idea. It, it, it's, a, it's a pretty good argument in terms of the way philosophers do things. But a different kind of theology would be what we call theology from below. And theology from below would say, let's not make any assumptions about God that are not confirmed by something we trust in the real world, Okay. Uh, and, and that so there's lots of different um, from below theologies that would say let's def let's figure out what God is like based on my personal experience or the experience of my community for example, and that's a really uh, it was a very very good pre modern way of doing theology. So if you think about for example um, Greek religion right uh, Hellenistic religion or really any um, any pre modern society's religion. It tends to be uh, what, polytheistic, and it tends to kind of divinize or make um, God or gods out of the natural world, right? Well, you can see that this is, this is a, a, a kind of from below theology. It's like it's saying, hey, we've noticed that um, we have no power over thunder and lightning, but they, are, they're really, they have a lot of power over us, right? Or we've noticed that the ocean is not something we can control, and it's really, really dangerous. Um, boy, the sun really does seem to help make our crops grow. That's a good thing. And so ancient societies would then divinize either the sun itself or the person responsible for the sun's activity or the, you know, the, the moons or the stars or the oceans or the storms. And, and you can see then that we would have like the polytheism of Greek, Norse, really any um, pre-modern theology, with the exception, of course, of Judaism. Um, but aside from Judaism, that's just how the world and how human beings do a very straightforward, from-below theology. And it, it comes with some problems, namely that you can it's hard to imagine that these gods are getting along very much, and it's very easy to anthropomorphize them. Right? It's very easy to make the sun and the moon and the waves and, the, and whatever gods they are or are responsible for them tend to be a lot like us. And that's because what, I mean, our model for personhood, if we're just doing experiential theology, theology from below tends to be who we are and what we know about human beings. And we just assume that, you know, the god or gods are like us only more so, right? And so the principal difference between Zeus and, and uh, me is that Zeus can control thunder and I can't. But we're both selfish, greedy, intemperate, whatever, right? And and so the gods are capricious. And so the, the gods that the Israelites deal with, you know, Baal, Ashtaroth, um, the, these gods are very, very bizarre gods. And they have very weird needs, uh, needs that we would probably describe as perverse and, and violent and sick. Marduk um, is another example. So there's a huge danger in from, be from below theology, a, a danger that from above theology mitigated. So classical theism, if you think about it as a reaction to uh, the, the sort of pre-modern notions of what the gods were like, if you think of it that way, um, classical theism is a, is a huge step forward in understanding um, the, the divine because it... it it kind of takes away, or at least as much as possible, stops us from making God into us, right? And if you think about uh, the reading from last week from Aquinas, like, isn't that really what Aquinas is saying? Is like, whatever you want to say about God, it, God is infinitely beyond us. God's not us. We're not God. 
And so classical theism protects divinity from being um, just a projection that we make onto the deity. Uh, so there's various agreements about how successful that is. So for example, the protest atheists and the fathers of modern atheism, for example, Feuerbach, Freud, um, uh, and others, Darwin, uh, not necessarily Darwin, they, they, would, they would question, um, did we really succeed in making God not like us? Uh, and they would say that really we, we've done a terrible job of it, and that's why they don't believe in God. But whatever. The, the idea being that you can see how much less um, the God of the philosophers is like us compared to uh, pre-modern gods and goddesses, right? The, there's a massive disconnect between Marduk, who's like battling and, and, and killing and demanding violence, compared to this god that's beyond all, is infinite, eternal, perfect, good, all that stuff. That Those two are so far apart, you can see the value in it. So if we're going to make a critique of classical theism, and I think this is what's happened in uh, Christian theology over the last 100, you know, 100, 150 years, you want to critique the God of the philosophers. You want to say there's a problem with from above theology, but you don't want to recreate the problems of from below theology in the past. Okay. And that, that means that we, if we're going to do from below theology in a way that's, that's faithful and is true, especially as evangelicals, we need to have sure sources for our kind of information or input about who God is and what God is like. And the, the best place to begin for you know, evangelicals is to say the Bible, right? The Bible will be our kind of source book, if you will, for who God is and what God is like. Now, that can go a number of different ways, and as we discussed in the first week, it, it is possible to use the Bible sort of like a textbook and be like, ah, here's an example of God being, you know, just, or here's an example of God being merciful. God's this, God's that. And I think that um, might be a little bit too flat of a reading of the text, but I think it's the right, you know, place to start, because if we confess that Scripture is the... Um, the word of God, and it really is a truthful accounting of who God is, what God has done, um, then it's the, definitely the place to begin when we start doing um, systematic or constructive theology. And as we noted last week, once you start there, you start to realize if that, if, if everything's going to be guided by the Bible, right, then you're going to have a really hard time um, smashing together classical theism, the, the views about God that we have in, in classical theism from the philosophers with the actual texts. And this has been a really huge negotiation really since the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, where the Protestant Reformation says, hey, we need to go back to the texts, but is also saddled with the tradition of the church, which is the God of the philosophers. And I would say it took about two, three hundred years um, before it kind of became like, wait, this might not be possible, right? It might not be possible to, you know, match Yahweh, God of Old Testament, with infinite, perfect, never changing, um, passionless, uh, apathetic God, right? Because that doesn't look anything like Yahweh. And if you want to, con and if you want to say that God is like that, then you have to say, well, then everything we see about Yahweh is. In the Old Testament, is it's um, it's uh, it's metaphorical, or it's it's um, it, it's 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 condescending. God's condescending to show God's self in a way that human beings could comprehend at the time. But now we can toss it. We can move 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 back to to the God of the philosophers. And as an evangelical, that seems like a really bad way to go. So, from below theology needs to have a what we might call like a biblical theology or a kind of a constructive theology built out of scripture that highlights who God is. And if you kind of take the, the basic narrative or the story of the Bible and you start to say, what do, what do we see about you know, God over and over and over again? What, what is it that we see is the same in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you know, testifying to one being with a certain character, then you're going to get you know, something like an everlasting or eternal God um, holy, set apart, you know, completely other, but at the same time present, real, um, engaged. Uh, you're going to get um, 
hesed from the Old Testament, a God who's committed, who covenants, who's, um, who's absolutely committed in, in loving kindness and mercy to uh, God's people, then you're going to see that kind of in, in Jesus and his agape love, right? And so it's a love that's that just does not quit. It's, it, it goes after, you know, and keeps keeps um, attacking. That's not the best word, but keeps going after us. Um, you're going to see a God who's definitely in, invested in justice and making things right, but also really, really committed to mercy and to, you know, you, some people will say like restorative justice or rehabilitating. So God cares about justice, doesn't want to let evil get off the hook, but at the same time doesn't want evil just to get, dis, you know, people to be destroyed. God wants people to be restored, redeemed. So you see like a redeeming, saving, rescuing, liberating God. If you, if you put those, if you put those kind of attributes or characteristics together, it's going to be, that that picture of who God is is not going to do well with the picture of classical theism. They're not going to jive very well um, because at at core, and we saw this last week, this is a God who is who does have passion. God's God's passion, His committed love, His fierce, you know, love. That's that's. That's not that's not a, that's not a condescending to humanity. That's not so, that's really who God is. It's really what God's like. Um, God's relational. God wants to be involved. God is transcendent, but also present and imminent. Uh, God is just and cares about righteousness, but also gracious and merciful. These that doesn't make sense. Um, the God of the philosophers has to have like justice, justice, justice. Right? There, there's no if if God's just. And we define justice as everyone getting what they deserve. God can't also be merciful. <laughs> like if we define mercy as people not getting what they deserve, right? A, a God who there's no such thing as a balance between justice and mercy. If you're being, you know, very, very literal and thinking through the argument, if God is just, God cannot be merciful, <laughs> and if God is merciful, God cannot be just, and yet. The picture of that we get of God in, in the Bible is God's maybe not uh, maybe just in the way that we think everyone getting what they deserve, but certainly going after and trying to make stuff right, right? Trying to redeem and and correct and improve and and save, and 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 that is a sort of justice, but it's not anything like the justice that a philosopher would develop if they were coming up with the definition of justice that they could attribute to an eternal infinite being. So when we do from below theology, we are, you might say, saddled with the text. We cannot ignore uh, the Bible. We can't just explain it away and wave our hands. So a constructive contemporary theology is going to see, is going to give priority to the characteristics that God um, exhibits in Old and New Testament and is uh, perfectly enfleshed in, in the Incarnation. And when we do that, we may end up with a God that doesn't quite fit the philosopher's bill. And I would say that's okay. <laughs>